I want to talk to you about what made this particular day very special back then. Sometimes people don't get it. You know, they kind of miss the special nature of Christmas. And we try, you know, some of us try by saying, Merry Christmas, so that people know that, you know, it's not just happy holidays. You know, we really want people to know that this is, this is God's gift to us. What's the reason for the season? And, you know, it's all out of, you know, oh, man, I just don't want you to miss it. I don't want you to miss it, you know. But sometimes we do. Other people will do it with lights. Uh, you'll, you'll see people's houses lit up, you know, and some people are just really going hog wild this year, lighting their houses like crazy. I love it. I, I like excess sometimes. <laughs> I just think, man, I can't believe that they did this to their house, you know. How much do they pay for this day, you know, just to light those lights? I love it. I just love the colors and, uh, and I love the, uh, the new kinds of lights that come out every year. Uh, you know, those are kind of nice. These uh, LED lights are like brighter than ever. We bought LED lights for our Christmas tree. I can't even look at it now. <laughs> it blinds me. It's just so bright. But, you know, some people do that just to, you know, really just share the light, uh, the, the, the sentiment of the, uh, of the season. I loved it when the kids sang it. Uh, I love Esther singing, and she did such a wonderful job. And I love the little kids who haven't got an idea of what's going on. But <laughs> you know what? Some of them are just doing what they're, you know, they were trained to do, and others are doing just what comes naturally. And then there was like, there was a Charlotte there, you know. Can I get somebody to hold my hand? <laughs> you know, she had lost the point, you know, but. She had an agenda. Sometimes, you know, you just can't get through. Uh, and adults are like that, too. They're so caught up with what they're thinking and what they're feeling that they lose sight of the real big picture. And uh, so I'm really enjoying it. I hope you are, too. You're going to really enjoy it if you come back tonight uh, for the cantata. Best cantata we've done. Well, I know we've done it before. We do that thing every once in a while. But it's better than never. And, uh, People have put a lot of work in this, and it, we're, we're just so much enjoy singing it. Nobody comes. We're going to have fun anyway. But I know that many people will come. In fact, we have others who are coming from other lands. Uh, international people are, are coming tonight that have been invited. And I'm excited about that. I'm excited that they'll see something of our culture. But more than that, that they'll hear the good news of the gospel. And so I'm pretty excited about that aspect of it as well. Today I want us to focus on something where God is really trying to get people's attention. And that's in the book of Luke, chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. <clears throat> you may not notice it, but uh, I'll try to bring it out to you as we talk a little bit about it. Beginning in verse 1, we read these words. Well, I'll wait until you get there. <clears throat> it works better that way, because then you actually can read it with me. Luke chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to his place, his own town, to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee, to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and put him, placed him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. That's all we're going to study today. I want to talk to you about this because there's some interesting things that are going on here. This is sort of like the perfect storm. Convergence, a convergence of many different things that made this huge, very huge. First of all, we take note of the fact that the point at which it happened. 
it says, in those days. In those days. In what days? What was so significant about those days? Luke wanted us to understand that it wasn't like other days. It was those days. Well, what's he talking about? Well, first of all, it's the days that God had assigned. You need to understand, and I think it's very important for all of us, for comfort's sake and also for fear's sake, that God is in control of all things. And he is the one who has set and ordained all the things that must happen and should happen in their set times. And so that is exactly why it was in these days that these kinds of things happened. It was because it was God's will, and he had planned it. If we know that in our lives that God is doing the same thing just as he did in Mary and Joseph's life, I think we can derive comfort from that. That he has a purpose and a will, and it's a good purpose and a good will. Even though it may involve a great deal of suffering, God is indeed doing something that one day we'll look back on and say, Father in heaven, I worship you. I worship you for what you did in my life. I was not happy with many things as they occurred. I was not happy. In fact, I blamed you for things that I did not understand. But we'll look back at a time in the future when we see the paths that God had prescribed for us and we'll glorify him because his purposes were worked out and indeed his mercy was given to us. So it was a time in which God had planned all things. It was also a day in which a jealous king was ruling on the throne. And this jealous king, Herod, was a grievous, dangerous man. That would but cause us to wonder, God, did you sure, were you sure that this was the days that you should have done what you were doing? You brought your son down here to earth in, in the form of a baby, and you allowed him to live next door to this guy? And you knew that this man would hate him? He represented evil in its physical form who would not allow this king, who was the rightful ruler of the whole world, ever take his place because he was king of Jerusalem. Well, God protected him, and so that was not a problem. But we see in the convergence of all these things a reason for Jesus having to come because there were despots that were ruling the world and ruining the lives of many many people. Jesus had to come. There needed to be an answer for this. There needed to be a change in people's hearts. And Herod was indeed one of those that gave evidence of the fact of people's need for a Savior to come. It was also in the days of a connected world. You, you, you know, we kind of look at our world today and think about it and we say, man, we are so connected. Indeed, we are. You ever go on your, your Gmail and, and see advertisements that are just exactly what you may have bought or thought about, you know, a few days ago and all of a sudden they appear? We are connected. In some ways it's really scary, isn't it? I remember that Mita told me about her mother saying something about email, you know, or, or messaging or something like that. And she's, oh, that's so spooky. You know, that people can actually be that connected. Indeed, we are. But you see, that was an advantage back then because there was a gospel that needed to be communicated throughout the world. And you know what? It was ready. It was in place. It was time for the Savior to come so that the things that he would do in the world and, and certainly the greatest thing that he would do in dying for men's sins could be then propagated, that people could know that it was for their forgiveness. And they could come to be part of the church of Jesus Christ. So there was a, a world that was connected by government, connected by language, connected by a road system. You know, things that had not been in the past were now prepared and ready. So it was in those days that Jesus came. It was also in the days in which the religious leaders were, you know, so holding on to the things of God in their grip. They wanted things their way, and they wanted the power in their hands, and they would not relinquish it. 
to any young upstart who may be, you know, holding them accountable for how they were leading the people and worshiping God. And they would reject him. They would indeed crucify him. It was in those days that he was born. It was also in the days in which the synagogues were spread throughout the whole known world. Well, why is that a significant thing? Synagogues in all over the, the empire of Rome, because the Assyrians had spread them in the diaspora all over the place, so that they could not come together and organize against the, the empire that the Assyrians had. Why was that significant? Because when as the gospel went to these different places, there were synagogues where people were being trained in the Old Testament so that when the fulfillment of all those prophecies came in Jesus Christ, the light would go on and there would be people who would be prepared to be able to teach others who are Gentiles how this all fit together. They had the old story, the Old Testament, that led up to Jesus coming, and they were then able to say to others who had no idea what these things were about, you know what? This was prophesied. This was supposed to happen. And this is all the things God prepared for us that we might understand what Jesus was doing. So they were in place, and it was in those days. Lastly, it was the days which we now look back on as the center of all time. I know that in our world today, they're trying to erase that. They don't want to use the words B.C. and A.D. any longer, because it talks about Jesus. But for many years, we have always felt that this was in the year of our Lord, or that was before Christ because he was so significant. He was the most significant thing that ever occurred here in our presence as human beings. It was in those days, in those days that God did what he did. Well, talking about the point at which these things happened, we also need to talk about the people that were involved in it. Amazing how God brought these characters together. And I'm not saying characters in terms of their now, they're strange. I'm just saying that these were characters that were brought together here. And so Mary was one of them, and she was brought to the place where she would have her child in Bethlehem. Now, we all know that was a result of the edict that was given by the emperor. Can you imagine if he knew for a moment that what he was doing was actually to bring a lady to a place in Bethlehem so they might have a baby in a stall and lay it in a manger? He would, have never, he would have laughed. He would have thought, of course not. Me, the emperor, moving all of my empire to have a census for one thing like this? Never. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. God moves the hearts of kings. That's huge. <laughs> that is huge. But it happened. It happened. And Mary got to the right place. The shepherds. They got to the right place, too, as they came to where Mary was. <sighs> How did they get there? It wasn't an edict from the emperor. It was from these beings from heaven. These beings whom, whenever they are seen by humans, create enormous amounts of fear. People fall on their faces. People stand back in horror because of the greatness, the grandeur of these beings called angels. And angels came to lowly shepherds and said, your king's born, your savior has been born today, and you need to go see him. And so this is where you are to find him, in Bethlehem. Well, then there was the magi. They were brought there too. Interestingly, how they were brought by the movements of the stars. I mean, how big can you get, right? Constellations coming into place so that they could read and understand that something extremely significant, something way beyond anything. In fact, they were going to find out who was the king of the Jews that had been born, and where did they get that from? But God moved the heavens. He started it off when he created everything and set things in motion so that at the exact right moment, things would be in place so that these men could be there. God brought them there. Talk about a convergence of really unusual kinds of events. What's really uh, kind of interesting, though, about this whole bringing people together is that who is not there? 
Who was not there? Well, we read that Herod heard that there was a king born, and he immediately thought, Messiah. And he was going to get rid of him for sure. And so he consults with all the religious leaders, the teachers of the law, and they were able to tell him. They were able to say in Bethlehem, of course, Micah 5.2, everybody knows that, right? Micah 5.2, O oh Bethlehem, Judea, thou art smallest among all the cities, yet out of you shall come one who will rule. And so what we see here is that they knew exactly where to go, but they didn't go. They had no interest. You see, it bore no hope for them. It was actually something contradicting what their deepest desires wanted. They wanted to maintain control of their own lives, maintain control of their own people, and this was a threat. Why should they think that this ever would happen in their lifetime? And they didn't want it to happen even if it did. So they were absent. Another convergence that we see here, not only are we talking about the point at which it occurred or the people who were brought together, but we see also the prophecies that were involved as well. Now, you know about the prophecy in Isaiah chapter 7 about a, a, a virgin having a child. So we see Mary being taken with her husband to Bethlehem, and it was no unusual thing. I mean, not, it was an unusual thing for her to go there and to do this in the state that she was. Do we get how, how completely impossible it was for her to be pregnant having known no man? The virgin birth has never happened before. It will not happen again. It will only happen at this point in time as a result of prophecy 700 years before saying this is what's going to happen. Other prophecies too. I already mentioned Micah 5 2. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrata, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Yes, indeed. And so we see the fulfillment and the place Bethlehem. Why? Because it was the city of David. As David had been told by Nathan the prophet, the Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you who will come from your own body and I will establish his kingdom. And he is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish his throne of his kingdom forever. Prophecies about this baby at this time bringing these people together. The plan that brought it all together is something I think is also amazing. And with this I close. The plan was graciously involving the problem in the solution. You'll remember back in the Garden of Eden that it was Eve who was deceived by the serpent and who tempted her husband Adam to sin against God. She was given at that time a prophecy that she would know that she would also in her descendants be part of the solution of that problem God spoke to the serpent and he said this, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between her, your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. And so now we see the fulfillment of that prophecy of the one being born who would in fact crush Satan's head. And who was used? A woman a woman by the name of Mary. In the Garden of Eden, Eve surrendered to the deception of the serpent. Mary now surrenders herself to the will of God uh, to become the mother of the Messiah. I am the Lord's servant, she said. May it be to me as you have said, as the angel left her. Eve did not understand suffering. She only wanted the, what power and pleasure she thought that God had withheld from her. Mary 
trusted her Lord and understood the suffering that she would endure so that the incarnation would occur, she then obeyed his will. This is really huge. The surrendering of oneself. God involved men in the solution. Mary carried this child. She understood the suffering. She knew she would be spoken about. People would be whispering behind her, her back all the time in her life. But that was only the beginning of the suffering. When she went to dedicate him at the temple, Simeon came and spoke to her, and the very last thing that he said to her was that this would cause a sword to pierce her heart. The ridicule went on and on throughout her life. The misunderstandings of who this Messiah would be also plagued her. as She, she saw Jesus doing things that she thought maybe he should not do, and, she, and her sons would come to him and say, Jesus, you need to come home with us not understanding all that God had intended for him to do. It was also her heart that was broken as she watched her son die upon a cross. That was her life. That was the life that God had planned for her. Do you suppose that at any point she might have said something like, God, who am I that you should do these things to me? I have heard many people say at times, I don't like my life. I hate my life. I hate what God has done. Where is God when, when I need him? Why did he give me this kind of life? Why was I given the parents that I had? I see people around me that have great happy lives. And I, I suffer all the time. So Mary becomes the person who not only accepts the will of God for her life, but she becomes the one who exhibits how it should be done. And she, she teaches the principle that yes, God does call us to suffer, but as we trust him in the suffering, there will come from the suffering things that are far greater than the suffering. Amen. And eventually, we'll see it. I'm sure it was difficult for her to see as she looked upon her son hanging upon a cross. No one would have blamed her for all the weeping and sorrow and the, and the agony that she was enduring. Nobody at that point would say, take courage, Mary. It's going to be fine. It's going to be all right. But that was the truth. The suffering would be painful and indeed it would be terrible to endure. But she would say to you today, I am so glad God chose me. You remember the Magnificat? Not a word would she take away from that as she expressed her joy at God's choosing her, that women and men would call her blessed. She still feels that way, only now she understands why. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All of these things came together. What should it be our response? How do we respond in this time of season? Well, obviously, I think it's important for us to give. For that is what has been happening, that we've been talking about. God has given his son fully, knowing what it would cost him. And so also should we. Even as we read the story of the young boy doing that, the, all the chores for his father. Very simple, but very co compelling as we, are, we would desire to have that kind of joy that people would receive that which we've put together and thought through and, and given. And it can come in any form. It doesn't need to be wrapped with paper. It can be wrapped in love, in an experience. It's never too late for those kinds of things. Christmas Bay be over before you can do what you think you ought to do. But you should do it anyway, for it's the calling of our lives every day, every day. Secondly, I think it's really important for us to understand that even though we're talking about giving gifts and the joy and the sentiment of the season, that indeed there is still a lot of suffering going on around us. There are those that are weeping while we are rejoicing. We want to be mindful of that, and we want to be giving out to to. to 
to diminish people's sufferings in whatever way we can. We have done some of those things in the giving of meals and in the going down to Kensington and to singing Christmas carols when we go around. All of those things help people through this time. But there may be people that you know personally that you know are not going to have a really good time and that this is a difficult time of year for them. Do something for them. Personal. I don't know what it would be. You have to find that out. Talk to the Lord about it and give whatever way you can. It's in the giving that the season begins to have a meaning for us and that we rejoice in God's gift to us as we emulate, we, t we image him in how he has intended us to live. Let's pray together. Father, thank you. Thank you that we can give. Thank you that you've given us opportunities to give. I think of the church next door to us, Lord, whose money was all taken away. And Lord, I pray that if you lay that on the hearts of those who are a part of our congregation to give generously to that, I praise you, Father, and thank you. For surely we have this familial, familial relationship with them. They're, they're one of us. We love them. And I pray that this would be a time of year where we would reach out to those in need there or people individually whatever the case may be thank you so much father thank you in jesus name we pray amen let's stay together as we sing one